Voidborn by Justin Proben. He was in his quarters, near the rear of the vessel, when the alarm woke him from his rest cycle. He looked hazily about, orientating himself to the sound. The chamber was empty, the bunks were unmade, and the lockers on the wall hung open. His team must have responded to the alarm just a moment ago, but why hadn't they woken him? He hadn't received any distress calls from their channel either. He hit a dial, and the stasis pod opened, letting out a rush of rejuvenating vapour. He was already dressed, always ready, an owl's superfluous habit from his time in service. He moved sluggishly, still in a stasis haze, not yet fully recovered from the void jump of the day before. He fell from the pod and scrambled to his feet, feeling for the pistol as he stumbled to the dorm's doorway. He tripped over his own tired feet, staggered over the dents in the grating floor, before he fell against the passage walls and swayed down the hallway. He was headed straight to the command deck, standard protocol in an emergency. The vessel was desolate, with not a single crew member in sight. Where the fuck is everyone, he thought, shaking off the drowsiness and picking up his pace. He rounded a corner, his hand on the iron railing for support, only to find the command deck dark and lifeless as it loomed up on him from beyond the access door. The command deck was usually a tumultuous hub of activity, navigators relaying orders to crew members, the captain shouting instructions at the navigators, but now a silence hung over the place, one which mimicked the cold quiet of the vacuum through which they floated. What? He had only taken one step forward when the red alert lumen blinked on for a moment, and he saw what occupied the room now. He stopped, his mouth slowly opening as his jaw quivered. Bodies, close to forty, lay in lumps of tattered meat on the grating floor, their blood dripping on the piping below. Most were unidentifiable, too chewed up, but he recognised a few faces. The captain was there. The emblazoned badges that coated her garb were visible, even in the darkness. Despite being a mere merchant officer, the air of authority and precision she gave off when in command had elevated her in his eyes to something more than human. A machine, perhaps. But there she lay, her face contorted in fear and her guts dangling through the grating like the rest of them. Disgust crept its way across his bunched-up features. It wasn't the sight that disturbed him, he had seen plenty of it during the course of his service, but rather the smell. He'd never gotten used to the stink of death and a mixture of iron and defecation filled his nose now, engulfing his senses with its sour odour. He choked, nearly retching for a second, before straightening himself and wiping the spittle from his mouth. He was dreaming. He had to be. He walked deeper into the room, hoping to wake with each passing second, but the seconds became minutes, and the gallery of horror returned with each flicker of the lights. He slipped his hand to his firearm and moved toward the access door. Without peeling his eyes from the scene, he pressed the receiver to his ear, connecting to his team's shared channel. Hello? What the hell is going on here? Static. Stevens? Parshan? Anybody? Can someone tell me what the fuck is going on? There was desperation in his voice. Fear. Their lives were under his command. They were his responsibility. He had a duty to keep them breathing, keep them serving, even if he'd already failed the poor butchered souls laying before him. Again, nothing but static. He was about to disconnect from the orcs channel when he froze. Hello? He swore he'd heard something over the static. A soft whisper, ephemeral, but definitely there. He felt the sweat on his neck go cold, the hair on his nape rising as he tried to imagine what could have made such a noise. He waited, his eyes closed as he focused in on the scrambled feed, but the whisper did not repeat. After another moment, he tapped the device in his ear with a finger, muting the channel, and set his mind to the situation at hand. The way I jump. He spun, dropping himself down to one knee and trained his pistol on where the voice had come from. His aim darted from left to right, the torch on his pistol illuminating the electrical circuits and piping on the walls as he searched for the speaker. Nobody. Nothing was there. He'd started to sweat profusely, and his grip on his pistol grew slick. Temperature control seemed to be failing now that the command deck was out, and the air was hot and heavy. To damnation with this, he said under his breath rising from his knee. He was going to radio in the closest battle-class frigate and pick a bigger gun from his quarters. He looked back at the command deck and recited the Vigilus of the Crown for all the souls that had died there, then turned to leave. He managed to take two steps before they came for him. At first, all he heard was hurried, irregular footfalls and raspy breathing. He couldn't see where it came from, but he felt it getting closer. 
Adrenaline pumped through his veins as he steeled himself, still facing the dark hall. Time seemed to slow as the sound grew louder and more chaotic. Louder. Louder still. And then, the red lights flickered, and he caught a glimpse of what hunted him. Lumbering shapes, four of them, shambled down the main hallway toward him. They moved in and out of the light, staggering closer with each passing second. Who's there? He shouted, flashing his pistol's torch at them. The hall was long, and the light barely illuminated the figures, who had become more distinguishable as they moved closer. He noticed one of them had something in its hand, oddly shaped and rigid. Still, he couldn't quite make out their features. Identify yourselves immediately! Still, the figures moved closer and closer. Blast you! He shouted with a snarl. Who in damnation is that? Nothing spoke, and he shook his head. With the massacre that lay just behind him, he wasn't taking any chances. He aimed his pistol, leveling it at the closest of the figures, and made ready to fire. As his finger squeezed gently against the trigger, the first figure blinked into view of the red lumens, and he froze. W what in the crown's name? It looked human, but no god of his could have had a hand in its creation. Bone, twisted and malformed, jutted from its repulsive body like bloody spikes. Talons had formed where fingers should have been, splitting out from the thing's hands like bestial claws. Its movement and color could only be likened to that of a corpse, and fetid skin hung loose from it, riddled by scars and fresh gashes. Black Pit stared at him where its eyes should be, gleaming in the red light as it moved toward him. With each step its body convulsed, clicking and bending into perverse shapes it had no right doing. The object he'd noticed before was clutched tight in the creature's talons, a severed arm. He felt bile in his throat as he recognized the ripped fatigues of his team's uniform, still clinging to the ligament. The three other figures came into view. Horrific as their appearance was, none of them bore any semblance of emotion or pain on their faces. They made no sound, save the crack of joints and gurgled attempts at breathing. They simply shambled forward, pupilless eyes trained on him. What abominations are- He cut himself off. That question was irrelevant right now. Instead, he aimed his pistol and fired. Round after round of heated energy tore through the creatures, sending bits of them splattering backwards down the hall, but they didn't falter. Singed holes in their flesh smoked and sizzled, but caused not so much as a flinch. Again he fired, and fired, and fired, until the cooling chamber of the plasma core in his firearm released a jut of gas, indicating the charge pack was empty. He swore loudly. He'd blasted off the leg of one, forcing it to the ground, but the others still came at him. He stumbled backwards as the closest of the abomination swung its talon, catching him across his stomach and ripping through him. He screamed out in pain and kicked the beast backwards into those that followed it. Acting quickly, he lurched onto the command deck and slammed the lock panel, bringing the doors down with a bang. The creatures pushed up against the barricade and started slashing violently at the door. He gritted his teeth as he watched them. It was his only way out. Catching his breath, he touched the wound at his side and felt the steady flow of warm blood quicken in his hand. It needed immediate attention, but he lingered at the door for a moment, watching his attackers through the viewing portal. Soon they were joined by countless more. The creatures lashed out at the metal with elongated nails and the chitinous talons that grew from their skin. Whatever material it was that made their spikes and claws, it seemed stronger than normal bone, and soon they were shaving off pieces of metal from the barricade. What bits of bone and flesh that broke and tore in their frenzy did little to slow them. They did not relent. Their faces remained emotionless, unchanging. What are these fucking things? He backed away from the door and turned to face the grotesque montage of blood and death that had been painted there, the command deck as canvas. This was a simple trade vessel. Its design was dated, and the architecture resembled that of a machinarium facility on a factory world. Various shades of grey and brown mixed with poor lighting to create an aesthetic that did little to stimulate. It wasn't supposed to. Ships of this class, no longer than a few kilometres in length, are purposed to deliver crops from the agri-worlds to major supply depots. That's it. It wasn't a high prince's vessel, and it certainly wasn't a fighter. It didn't have to be. Its roots took it through monarchical space, between sectors guarded closely by the crown world of Aegisar. He looked out the massive viewing aperture into the dark space beyond. He had no idea where they were. A few stars blotted the desolate vista, but nothing distinguishable jumped out at him. He moved as swiftly as he could to the mapping station, stepping over the bodies of the fallen, leaving red footprints in his wake. But the system was down. Not unusual after a jump, it would return to a functioning state within the hour. They were due at Outpost Sigma, 
and had entered Void Travel just before he took to his quarters. But the station was nowhere in sight. Where else could they be? Any interference with the route they plotted couldn't have gone unnoticed, he thought to himself. The crew were all still alive before the jump. He cursed. Security wasn't as tight on trade vessels. Private contract teams lobbied and tended for positions aboard the vessels, and expected little incident. The only other armed personnel aboard were the captain and her detail. Little good they'd done. The captain's gauze pistol lay near a pile of meat that had once resembled a person. He realized he was trapped here, in this graveyard, this floating tomb. He decided then and there that he wasn't going to take the coward's way out. He'd stick to his plan, get a message off the ship to anyone who was listening. With any luck, a battle barge or frigate from the 27th would pick up on it and blast him and the ship to kingdom come. He limped himself over to the closest navigation interface, still clutching at his side. The body of a young navigator lay at the foot of the panel. His face, or what was left of it, was locked in a state of shock, his eyes staring lifelessly from their sockets. The boy was no older than 20 solar cycles, young for a navigator, but not unheard of. He'd seen just over 40 cycles himself, the better part of it spent in conflict, fighting a war against the treasonous, the heretical, and those who had just wanted the right to rule themselves. That was his purpose. He looked again at the boy. A savage death like this was for men like himself, not for scholars who'd never held a rifle, never killed a man. He took a moment to pity the boy, before pushing the body off the platform so that he could take his place. He turned back to the comms unit connected to his earpiece and set the broadcast range to sector wide. This is Manus Ragor, former first lieutenant of the 25th Company, loyal servant of His Highness and the Monarchy. The trade vessel my detail is assigned to has come under attack. The losses are great. The enemy, unknown. Their intent, unknown. We have been compromised. Request immediate purge of my location. Does anybody read me? He waited a moment before switching the comms over to receive. Static. More fucking static. He cursed again, and spat. There was blood in his spit now, and it tasted like iron in his mouth. He smashed a fist into the display screen, letting out his rage in a single sharp movement. The glass cracked beneath his hand, slicing into his knuckles, and the unit went quiet. His anger evaporated with a white noise, and a heavy silence fell upon him once more. The movement had been too much for the gash at his side, and pain erupted, firing off from the nerves around the wound. He groaned, and fell to the floor. He grabbed at the open cut with both hands, trying to squeeze it closed. The adrenaline pumping through him had served to dull the pain, but his efforts were futile, and he knew it. Eventually, he relaxed his grip and crawled over to the comms unit, propping himself up the side of it. He felt moisture against his back, the clotting blood of the young navigator, and he looked down at the boy. He wouldn't look like that when his time came. He wouldn't look shocked or scared. Marnus closed his eyes and bit his lower lip until it bled, reining in his emotions like he'd been trained to. He wouldn't go like that. There'd be honor in his death. He let out a controlled breath and waited for those things to get in. His eyes bolted open. The comms clicked again, and the familiar light of an incoming message appeared on the broken display. Marnus's back was to the display console, and he stared straight ahead into the darkness of the command deck, waiting for the audio to play. The message rang out, like a cold wind echoing around the empty room. The way is open. He would die soon. The wound he clutched at his side was spilling over his fingers and pooling on the floor around him. It was too deep to treat with flame or suture, even if those options were available to him. This would be his grave, his body laid out against the aviation panel of the command deck. Even the faded crimson color of his uniform could not mask the measure of blood that adorned him now. He wasn't afraid of death. There were worse things to fear in this universe. He asked for nothing from the crown, and spoke no litanies of redemption, yet, in his last hour, one burning wish filled Marnus Rhaegor. That he would live to feel the fire of artillery rain down upon this vessel and know that those things burned with him. He could hear them still, the silent monsters, scratching, clawing at the access door. The only sound that echoed throughout the ship was the grating of their bone and nail on metal. That, and his laboured breath. The red lumen still flickered rhythmically, bathing the darkness in a crimson light before blinking out again, but the alert had long since played its droning melody. A loud clang from the access door brought his mind back to focus. 
The creature's scratching had thinned the metal enough to damage its integrity, and the blasted thing had started to bend inwards. He gritted his teeth in frustration, and knocked his head hard against the comms unit. He was still clinging to the hope that a passing patrol would pick up his alert signal. The gash in his gut was starting to smell. The creature's bony talons had dug deep, splitting intestine and flesh alike. He closed his eyes and gathered himself, before looking down at the wound. It was a mess. Bits of gut hung freely, ripped from his uniform, and blood flowed freely down his waist. He was familiar with wounds like this, of this severity. It meant death. A long, excruciating death, but death all the same. He swallowed a pang of nausea and tilted his head back again, letting the hand that covered the wound fall to his side. He felt weak and shaky. The blood loss was taking its toll, and he closed his eyes. The light of the red lumen burned like a fire when it came on. He felt the warm glow in his face as the light illuminated the little capillaries that forked through his eyelids. The rhythmic hum of the ship's main engine many floors below lulled him into a trance and he drifted down into himself. He saw visions of his life. He saw his past, his time as a boy on Forotina. He saw himself in a regimental uniform. He saw how proud they were. He saw the splintered heads of comrades cleaved by the barbaric weapons of the enemy. He saw worlds bathed in blood. He saw solar systems burn. He saw. He was barely conscious when he heard the access door split and the creatures enter. The sickening sound of flesh grating on the raggedy tear in the metal door made him smile. A wry, resigned smile. He didn't open his eyes at first, hoping it would happen quickly. But when no blow came, he blinked his heavy lids into a squint. At first the red light was unbearable, and he grimaced. But once his eyes adjusted, he caught a glimpse of his assailant standing around him, motionless. Why did they not attack? What are the- That was when he noticed, and a sick feeling welled up inside of him. They bore the regimentals of his team. The overalls of crew members, engineers, doctors, cooks, and the deep cuts on their faces that seeped thick murky blood looked self-inflicted. Some had even gouged their eyes out or split their tongues into forks. The markings on their skin were not random either, an iconography of sorts. The symbols were unknown to him, but there was a precision to the cuts that unnerved him. He had seen horrors unimaginable in his time serving the crown, but the sight of these things sent a shiver down his spine, the likes of which he had never felt. Come, you abominations, he spat in a fury. The crown will see my life avenged. It's the fires that await you now. He laughed. There was no bravado to the sound, no forced smile on his face. He was truly happy with the thought of their flesh squealing in the heat and their skin blistering and blackening. You'll, he began, but choked on the blood that had started to fill his lungs. Droplets sprayed from his mouth with a wet wretch. He was fighting hard to stay conscious now. He wanted to know the true enemy, spit in his face as he faded away. You'll, he began again, when an arctic cold washed over his body and numbed his lips. You'll... He didn't have the strength left. It was time to die. But as he closed his eyes and tried to remember better times, a shadow shifted in the corner of his eye. It looked to be moving, the darkness itself. The air shimmered around the shapeless mass, the shadows twisting and warping about the presence. And then that form stepped forward, and despair so unforgiving filled every corner of his psyche. An onyx black creature, shaped like a man, walked over to him. The space around the figure flickered and shimmered, blurring into the background as it moved, as if the universe was trying to reject its presence but couldn't. It had no features, its skin like that of the void, and it exuded a black smoke that turned his breath to icy vapor. When it spoke, it made no sound. Instead, he heard its words pierce his mind like a brick of burning hot coal. The way is open now. The voice he heard in his head rang out like a choir, various octaves and tones coalescing into one fell harmony. Behind the veil you found death, but death, you will find, begets life. Manus couldn't speak. He couldn't utter a sound in the presence of this thing. His eyes fell to the bloody corpses that lined the deck and he shuddered, realizing it was his death spasm. He would join them soon. He looked back to the creature, back into the abyss, and waited. You will help me. Let me show you the Nirvana. The thing knelt down and reached out, gently placing its hand on his face. He tried to recoil, but found himself unable to move. When it touched him, Manus's conscience fell into himself, and in that instant he saw oblivion. He saw a darkness so malign and pure that he wept. He saw the void spread out across the stars, 
breaking through the boundaries between it and real space. Like a parasite, it consumed. It ate men, it ate stars, and it ate galaxies. In that void, he saw the same darkness that clung to the presence before him. No! He pulled his head away, finally able to resist, but the images remained, seared onto his retina like some unholy projection. What are you? The thing stood up and shifted its form to stare at him with its eyeless face. In that moment, he felt himself being weighed and judged by a force beyond him, beyond anyone. We are you. Those three words resounded in the depths of his mind, like an echo in a well. And like that, Marnus Regal was gone. Grand Vizier Julian Zubo stepped from the docking bay onto the Vixen. His interrogatorial regalia drew a stark contrast to the rusted metals of the trade ship's interior. A hot, stale air washed over him as he walked toward the group of officers gathered for his arrival. Report. Colonel Gabe Ishart stepped forward and bowed. My lord. Zubo walked past him without acknowledgement, his hands hidden in white silk gloves and cupped behind his back. The colonel, who was mid-bow, noticed the slight and scowled at Zubo's back. Fucking royal prick, he spat under his breath and hurried after the vizier. He had had many dealings with the court, both during his service days and more recently. They were all like this. Forty-three dead, including the subject. My team was collecting rations in the canteen when firing erupted. We thought he was in stasis, still recovering from the jump. It's been taking more out of him each time, but this time, something must have snapped. Was he being monitored? The vizier retorted. No. Zubo stopped and turned to face him, a cold glare in his eyes. Why not? He was terse, impatient. We didn't think- Don't think, the vizier interrupted. That is not your job. He shook his head and continued his march, before rounding the corner to the command deck. As per his orders, the scene remained untouched. There, slumped against a navigation panel, was the former first lieutenant. Zubo's detail retched at the smell. The ship was humid with the rotten odour of bloated corpses, yet he stood stoic, his eyes examining the mess. Tell me again what happened. Ishart stepped forward from behind him, wiped sweat from his brow before removing his fibrous gloves. The bastard wouldn't stop shooting. I don't know what had gotten into him. It must have been the jump. The moment he saw us, he shot Delph in the leg and emptied his pistol onto the rest of us. Grand Vizier Julian Zubo nodded as he filled out a data sheet before waving a hand at the colonel to continue. He managed to get away from us and hold himself up on the command deck for a couple hours. The colonel pursed his lips and shook his head. The things he did to those poor people. Do continue, the vizier prompted. He had a wealth of testimonials to record today and the task was already growing tiresome. We splashed Macandrite over the doorway and managed to cut our way in. When we found him, he was almost gone. He kept shouting at us to stop, but it was like he was talking to someone else. The colonel pointed at his eyes and shrugged. He wasn't tracking us when he spoke. Fucking mad. Did he say anything else? Something about the way being open? The colonel stared at the Grand Vizier, waiting. Zubo hesitated for a moment, and Ishan thought he saw a flicker in his eye. Show me the footage from the command deck. The Vizier was emotionless as he watched the playback of scenes from the evening before. Yet when the recording finished, a low gravity tone hummed in his throat and his features furrowed. He repeated the scene of Marnus Regal muttering to himself and paused it, his eyes focusing on the vapour that escaped his lips with every word. Hmm. Zubo looked up and around him. The heating system was malfunctioning then, as it is now? Yes, my lord. Perhaps it was the heat. I'm feeling a little crazy myself. Ishant wiped more sweat from his brow, cringing inwardly at his half-assed joke. The vizier ignored him. I'll take the rest of the testimonials in my private quarters. Without another word, he strode off, leaving Ishart and his unit in bemused silence. The moment Zubo stepped back aboard his vessel, he signaled to an interrogator captain from his personal detail. Ready the ship for void travel. We return to Aegisar at once. Yes, Vizier. The interrogator bowed and made to leave before pausing. And the vixen, my lord? He sighed, more void-born, here in monarchical space. Purge it, 